Welcome to the first lecture of the fall 23 lecture series. Um, just a brief note, uh, this lecture uh, also counts for AIA continuing education credit. So if any of you need the credits, uh, there's a sign up sheet uh, right in the lobby. So you just put your AIA number and your name and uh, we'll turn it in for you. So this uh, evening's lecture uh, is the KPF lecture sponsored by KPF and tonight we're welcoming Eric Owen Moss. A little bit about the KPF lecture. The Sheldon Fox Cone Pedersen Fox Endowed Lecture Fund was established in 2007 in the memory of Sheldon Fox. One of the firm's founding partners and in 1953 graduate of the UPenn Masters in Architecture program. The purpose of the fund is to bring endowed architects to the Weitzman School to speak of their work and inspire members of the community each year. It also goes without saying that is it appropriate to remember that and celebrate the life of Jean Cohn, who is an undergraduate who received his undergraduate and master's degree in architecture from Penn. Please join me in thanking KPF for their steadfast support toward Weitzman and welcoming Jorge Mendoza, director, Winjin Chen, associate principal, and Kurt Nelson, designer, uh, to tonight's lecture featuring Eric Owen Moss. Also, a quick thank you to Winka for inviting Eric to come join us this evening. Thank you very much. So Eric needs no introduction, but for those of you who are maybe less familiar with uh, his long list of accomplishments, I want to go through a few of them. Eric Owen Moss was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. He received his Bachelor of Arts from the University of California, Los Angeles, and holds a master's degree in architecture from the University of California, Berkeley College of Environment Design and Harvard's University Graduate School of Design. Moss has been a longtime professor at SciArc and uh, served as its director from 2002 to 2015, before and on. Under his leadership, the school developed the SciArc Emerging Architects and Designer, uh, sorry, the SciArc Gallery Program that has commissioned more than 50 installations to esta by established and emerging architects and designers. This, uh, he has also chaired at Yale and Harvard Universities. Erico and Moss Architects was founded in 1973. The Culver-based uh, office has completed projects in the United States and around the world. The firm is best known for its ongoing revitalization of a former industrial zone in an area of the central Los Angeles and Culver City, consisting of industrial and warehouse buildings that have been abandoned as industry moved abroad. Since 19. 86, EOMA has been working to transform this neighborhood into a campus for creative-minded companies and has attracted some of the most successful design, film, internet, and digital media companies in the world. Moss has been honored with numerous distinguished awards, including the Academy Award in Architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the AIA LA Gold Medal, the Distinguished Alumni Award from the University of California at Berkeley, and the American Prize for Architecture, also known as the Louis H. Sullivan Award. This award is given to an outstanding practitioner in the United States that has an emblazed a new direction in the history of American architecture with talent, vision, and commitment, and has demonstrated consistent contributions to humanity through the built environment and through the art of architecture. The work of EOMA has garnered over 150 design awards, including from national, state, local AIA chapters, Progressive Architecture, uh, DuPont, Benedictus, Chicago, Anthenaeum, and the European Center for Architecture, Art, Design, and Urban Studies, and many others. The work of the office has been thoroughly documented in books, monographs, and publications internationally, including Eric Owen Moss, Construction Manual, published by AADCU. It has also been exhibited widely and featured regularly in the Venice Biennale. In 2010, Moss became the first foreign architect invited to curate a national pavilion in the Venice Architecture Biennale. 
I've always been uh, appreciative of the work of EOM, particularly the wide range of cultural artifacts that it draws from, both Western and non-Western, including art, poetry, dance, film, myth, and architecture. The timeless tropes embedded in these are transposed through architectural means of structure, geometry, space, form, and materiality to form profound architectural and urban consequences. With that, please help me welcome Eric Owen Moss. Good evening. Nice to see all of you. Thanks to Winka for the invite. I don't know if Bill Pedersen would uh, support this venue in this context, but thanks to Bill Pedersen and KPF for whatever the hell they did to, uh, to support this. It worked, you see that? So this is not a theory or an ideology. It's not a pro forma. It's not a method. It's not a system. I think I was fishing around for terminology to characterize the conversation. Maybe it's an interrogatory, although the term interrogatory has legal connotations, which are certainly not intend, but intended, but an interrogatory in the sense that it interrogates meanings in architecture, how we might or I might, whether you share it or not is an open question, but how we, my office and my staff, might find meanings and interpretations in architecture and how we might propose to do that. So you know the, on, on your left, do you know the Durr Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse? Yes, no, anybody know the drawing? This is 800 years old. War, famine, pestilence, death. Uh, it's a woodcut, end of the uh, 15th century. And the reason for showing that is, as an argument, there are periods of time when points of view are shared, coalesce, so understandings are in common. Vocabulary might be in common. This is a hypothesis. In common, shared, whether you read or whether you don't, whether you see it in a rose window or whether you don't. But the meanings, the biblical meanings, and this is in a Western context, a Western era, but there are others by analogy. So it's shared, meanings are shared, vocabulary is shared, heroes, villains are shared, and so on. On the other side is Courbet, um, who, uh, not sure how to translate the French title. It's sometimes, I used to put this up as the first slide in lectures, the madman or the misfit. And uh, this, is, this is a jump, but it may be if you can't do that on the left, and there's no coalescing of ideas and notions and theories and heroes that you wind up over here. Because essentially the point is, if without that one is left, or one, for me, on one's own. And there may be attempts to associate with particular ideologies, affiliations with strategies in design and architecture. But I think the point is, that doesn't exist now. It may exist again, uh, and I think my point would be, and this is a poem from a friend, you can read it, I don't need to read it to you, but we improvise instruments 
which means this isn't, again, solid as a theory uh, or as a method or as a system, but we're looking and we're working and we're using and we're investigating and we're discarding. So this is not a conversation in a bar in Berlin at three in the morning or something. This has a reality for us in terms of the way we work, the improvisation argument. I don't know if there's a laser here, but. So this is a time conversation. So do you know Phidias' head uh, on the hill of the Acropolis? So one could look at that as Phidias Athens, 500 BC, 400 BC, outside of time. So there's part of our conversation which belongs to a kind of time and eternity. So this might be the eternity for all of the issues that come and go, and there are components that, that endure. So the head, the Phidias head, which is very well known and is a symbol of that conversation, and then this is, this is out of a, uh, a Brecht play, which makes a very different point. So um, time and heaven, and this, this, I think, acknowledges a very particular point in the development of a conceptual model of who says what the earth is and the sun is and the, what are the rules. So one outside of time, one in time. The other one, uh, the upper right, um, is a couple of friends of mine hanging out. Uh, you're going to have to tell me uh, where that is. Can you tell me? You can tell me. So this is, this is two colleagues sitting in La Tourette arguing and smoking cigarettes um, or whatever they're smoking. And, and, um, but the quote is Melville. And it's worth thinking about because I think this has to do with who joins our conversation and who doesn't. And maybe by this standard, almost nobody joins because the who's not a slave argument has to do with who rules what you do, who predetermines what you do, to whom do you owe allegiance, to whom do you have affiliation, how are you obligated as an extrovert as opposed to how one is obligated internally as an, in, as an introvert? You know what I mean? Who's not a slave? Maybe no one, but these two characters, I won't tell you who they are, but uh, they might qualify. Um, this is Brecht. I think uh, the reason I, I have this Brecht stuff, I just happen to be reading this uh, play um, about Galileo. But it's not so much the, uh, the first statement or the second statement that interests me, although maybe you see the world of architecture as a land of heroes. So you have to tell me yes or no. But what interested me in this thing, and so I'll make an argument, you can think about this a little bit, that the truth, the truth, if there's such a word, is a tension between possibilities. It's not necessarily forever symmetry, never symmetry. But the truth is a tension between possibilities that contradict. That doesn't mean you bisect it or run it down the middle. That's what we're interested in, the tension between possibilities. This is a conversation that has to do, and there could be any number of four instances for this, a conversation that has to do with the arts as they're static or the arts as they're dynamic, as they are what they are, as they become something else. So where am I? So on the upper left, that's John Cage, whatever music is. So the, the 232 where, where we all walk in the concert hall and somebody sits down at a piano and plays not a note and somebody coughs and somebody sneezes and somebody moves. What's music is a conversation because the next piece of the conversation, you know what's coming is what's music, what's literature, what's architecture. 
the lower left is Umberto Eco. Maybe it's a section through Finnegan's Wake. Finnegan's Wake is a novel by James Joyce. Uh, take a crack at it. It's a tough one, but maybe it's worthwhile even in pieces. And uh, typical of Joyce's work, it actually begins, if it has a beginning at all, at the end. Anyway, this is, this is a section. So, so the novel begins where it no nominal, normally ends, and it's drawn. There's a map of it. There's a section map of it. What's literature? And then the last one is Giuseppe Tarani, whose who's work you probably know, in the 1940s, building Dante, building Paradise Lost. So in this conversation, what's architecture? It's building a poem, or is it? So the conversation about what's art, uh, what's literature, what's music, what's architecture, I think we would argue is a moving conversation. And we have to select the pieces that we'd like to move. Not sure how to describe this. It has something to do with humor and something to do with seriousness, uh, something to do with childishness, uh, which has its own appeal. But there are also roles, um, as I understand it, for, for us, for you and for me, for architects and for architecture. So uh, starting on your left, do you know King Lear a little bit? So the architect as fool, F-O-O, -O, this is vibrating a little bit, architect as fool, King Lear's fool, so if you remember, he's falling all over himself and making a mess and is in some ways the most intelligent and the most perceptive, the most articulate character in the game. And nobody knows, or hardly anybody knows. Whether architects are ready to assume that role, I don't know, but I'm offering it to you as an option so you can think about that. And then the next one, uh, maybe you know that cartoon. If you don't, it comes out of the 1930s, the Mickey Mouse and the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Do you know that one? So you don't expect to come to an architectural lecture and hear about Mickey Mouse. So today you do. So the sorcerer is a wizard and he wears a hat, a pointed hat, and he makes odd things take place. One of which is he commands brooms and brooms sweep up and whatever the hell they do. Sorcerer takes off his hat, sorcerer goes to sleep, Mickey steals his hat, puts it on and trouble. Architect as magician. Uh, next, next to that in the center, uh, Prince Valiant, I don't know if you know that comic strip, it's an old comic strip, fighting time. And ultimately, whether it's a loss, a win, or a tie, so you can decide, but in architecture and time, Prince Valiant. And then architecture and time, forever young, Jay-Z, or forever young, Bob Dylan, or forever young, Peter Pan. Time, no time. So, this is just for you, Florencia. Uh, so this is, uh, this is Cervantes, Don Quixote. So some of you know that novel, 16th century novel uh, from Spain. And there are two incidents that are particularly, I think, instructive to me, and maybe they're useful to you. So, um, one is the windmill story. Do you know the windmill story a little bit, or you know that story? So Don Quixote is, I guess, um, the chivalric knight in an era where chivalry is gone, and he's cruising around, a kind of introvert cruising around. He's riding around on a horse called Rocinante with his sidekick, Sancho Panza. Sancho Panza is a kind of... Um, every man more an extrovert, more conventionally understanding the world as he encounters it. So they come to the top of a hill <clears throat> and they see in the distance lots of windmills. And Don Quixote says, dragons, I'll attack. And Sancho says, are you loco? Are you nuts? 
Are you kidding? They're windmills. So Don Quixote charges, of course, and attacks and gets whacked and so on and so on. And then the question for the exam, if you take this as a literature course, is who was right? Dragons, monsters, or windmills? Who's right? Second image is, uh, which may have a particular poignancy at the moment, uh, the book burning. So they're trying to convince Don Quixote to quit uh, or to cease and desist being a chivalric knight. It's out of date, old news, don't do that anymore. Don Quixote goes to sleep. And while he's sleeping, the, uh, the lawyer, the priest, and the housekeeper go to the library. Why they go to the library? Because that's how he learns or comes to understand what a chivalric knight should do and how a chivalric knight should behave and all of that. So they go to the library, they pull out all of the books, and they burn all the books, hoping, aspiring, that now Don Quixote won't have a frame of reference and they'll be able to control his content and his behavior and all of that, which starts to sound familiar in terms of some current conversations. Didn't work. Didn't work. <laughs> he persisted. You know, Akira Kurosawa, maybe mid, late uh, 20th century Japanese filmmaker. And he makes a film called Rashomon. Uh, this is a little piece of it. And so what you're looking at is the bandit. And the bandit, with all of the art of Akira Kurosawa, you see the leaves move. You see the wind blow. You feel the wind blow. He's pretty good, Kurosawa. Feel the wind blow. Japanese, not so supportive, but pretty good. Exceptional. You feel the wind blow, and the bandit opens his eyes. If he doesn't open his eyes, there's no story. And he closes his eyes again, and the wind blows again, and he opens his eyes again. The wind does it. And from that point, he sees, uh, this is a, a kind of samurai rendition of feudal Japan, and there's a lady on a horse being led by a samurai warrior through the forest. And then a whole series of things happen, story from various vantage points. What's fascinating about it, and, and it's communicated in the making of the film, what's a film? Nothing happens if the wind doesn't blow. Nothing happens. And this is a function of accident. And I think in our world, in our frame of reference, whether it's the New York Times or, or Joseph Reichwert or whatever it is, arguing, analyzing, logic, analysis, argument, and so on. And there's just a question of whether accident is the anomaly and logic is the rule or whether the opposite is true, whether the rule is accident and the anomaly is logic. And this has something to do with the way we think about how architecture is done. Kurosawa on the left, uh, George Balanchine is a choreographer in New York City Ballet in the center. And this one you might not know, this is from the 20s, Victor Seastrom. Uh, who is a Swedish film director. Um, so this, this is fascinating. This, again, has something to do with what's a film, um, what's dance, uh, and, and very unusual, inventive, imaginative roles and conceptions that would be useful to us in understanding both what those are and how they evolve and what we might do. So the Kurosawa piece is Kurosawa himself in a film called um, uh, Dreams, which is eight vignettes. And he walks into a Van Gogh painting. So it's a new world. He makes a world. So he walks in, 
out of his world into Van Gogh's world, inhabits that world. Yeah, I can run this thing again. Yeah. I can get it to run again. So a making, a reconceptualization of the world, walking into Van Gogh. The second one is of particular interest to me in terms of, so this is precarious. It's, about, it's, it's from a dance by George Balanchine, choreo, choreographed by George uh, Balanchine, uh, called Agon. And the connection, the hands, the hand of the lady, the hand of the man, and they shake because they're balanced in a way which is precarious and you can't sustain the balance and it shakes. We're interested in that shake and making that, seeing if we can build that. And the last one is, is a film uh, made in the 20s called The Wind. And the, the manifestation of the wind is a horse that flies. It's a horse in the sky. And one of the things we've aspired to do is to build the flying horse. That's a definition for architecture. The last point, um, and I think I could phrase it best by saying, can you listen for what you haven't heard? Can you listen for what you haven't heard? So uh, Marco Polo goes to, to Cathay, and he works for 20 years. He leaves Venice or Genoa, whatever it is, and he goes to work for Kublai Khan, and he go, moves around, and he's an ambassador, and so on. After 20 years, he leaves, and he's going back to, to Genoa or to Venice, and Kublai Khan says to him in this rendition, when you go back, will you tell people what you've seen and how unusual it is and all of that? And he says, I'll tell them, but they only hear what they already know. They hear and understand what they've already heard. So I think my argument would be, as an architect, as a student, as a conceptual human being, can you listen for things you haven't heard? This is of interest to me because I think over long periods of time, this is the time and the no time conversation. But on the left is Angkor Wat in Cambodia, in the center is Salisbury Plain, Stonehenge. On the right is the Karak. Caracol, did I get that right? Caracol, snail, yeah, in, 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 uh, in the Yucatan. Nobody knows what the hell these things were. There are hypotheses. In other words, if you think programmatic conditions are determining factors, so this is worth thinking over long periods of time. In other words, form, shape, space, order of some kind, Where's the program? I, the the uh, Angkor Wat, and you probably know, is somewhere between some kind of government building and some kind of religious building, first Hindu and then Buddhist and so on. Stonehenge, there are a number of hypotheses of people with computer programs trying to fit the organization of the stones into that. And the Karakol, which is the only helical building that exists in the Yucatan, and what's that, chasing Venus or whatever it is. So form, shape, So my dad is, was a writer, and he used to make lists. And the lists were words, synonyms, antonyms, auditory conditions. And this is my list. So this is my response to him in a way. This is, this is my list of shape, of form, of space. No sight, no scale, no program my list.
One of the ways to think about buildings, you do, I do, we all do, this site, this country, this program, this date, this is a different kind of argument, which is, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's all one building. It's all one building. Did I convince you? Is it all one building? Uh, so I wanted to mention very briefly in our experience in working very substantially over a number of years in the LA Culver City area, which is essentially the west side of Los Angeles, and then extrapolating, extending from that to other projects outside uh, of Los Angeles and from outside to Los Angeles back into Los Angeles and that kind of that kind of reciprocity. Uh, it also suggests to me, this is another query, who's our constituency? So who are we talking to? We're talking to a client, a neighborhood, a city, a country. So are we talking to an LA neighborhood? talking to the city, we're talking to Philadelphia and New York, we're talking to Shanghai and Cape Town and London, which is, which is a kind of, and we may be talking, I think my answer to that would be we're talking to all of those. This is the most recent manifestation of that. We have a couple of colleagues in, uh, in Seoul and we just submitted a project with, with um, a local team for a museum in Jinju, uh, in South Korea. So that was that's the latest manifestation. But I think that that ongoing conversation has been, I don't want to use the word synergy, but is but but has been a kind of tension in a constructive way between what is more local and what is international and and the prioritization of those. Um, I don't know if there's anyone in here who is a fan of the. Hebrew Bible or Joshua, <laughs> three people are smiling and the rest are blank. Uh, but there is a story, and it's a fascinating story of the day when the sun stood still. So maybe you know that story from, from uh, Joshua. And interestingly enough, it's a story that many cultures share. So it comes out of the Yucatan, it comes out of India, it comes out of various places in East Asia and in Europe. But anyway, this is a particular one. So this is, I'm crediting Joshua for the commentary. And the reason I picked it, or the reason I think it's, it's a poignant way of describing, if you see that, if you hear that, they say, what the hell is he? It couldn't possibly happen. It'll never happen. It's a metaphor. It's a fairy tale. It's a fantasy. 
or could it have happened? And I think the the unlikelihood that it would that it would come to pass, but the prospect that it may have, or it still might, at least this is the reason for picking the metaphor, because I think it's a good association for a lot of the work we do. That it always appears to be fragile. We might not do it, or we can't do it, or maybe we'll do it, and then we do it. So, so this, is, this is a kind of interesting psychotherapeutic world to live in, but maybe the sun will stand still. So anyway, uh, this is a Chagall uh, painting, again, as a, a biblical reference with uh, Jacob. It's it translated in, in many different ways. Jacob fighting himself, Jacob fighting the angel, Jacob fighting God, and I used it because uh, this is something that uh, we have a book not too long ago, I'll see it when I believe it, and uh, some of you may know Jeff Kipnis, possibly is a critic among, and a self-critic among other things, um, uh, in the United States, and he wrote an essay in the book, and, and I don't say this is so, or it's accurate, but it fascinated me. I think it was an interesting argument. So he's looking at the work. We've known each other for a long time. And, and, spec and I, I, he uses the word agon, which is in, just a coincidence because I mentioned the Balanchine thing, which is also called agon, that tension where the lady and the man are shaking and they're trying not to shake and they can't prevent shaking because the position is intrinsically unstable. So anyway, this is his um, exegesis of what we're doing and why we're doing a kind of internal battle, kind of internal argument using a term which belongs to the Greeks. Um, this is a project which is both an old project. It was originally a competition we thought we had, and they said you can't build it. Uh, but this is the Smithsonian in D.C. You may know the one Sir Norman actually built it. It was a kind of rendition of what he did in the British Museum. So we made a submittal to that competition. And its origins are, do you know Seurat? Uh, so end of 19th century, so you know. And what, what always fascinated me about Seurat is that the content, you know, the Sunday in the park and all of that, that the pictorial content is extremely conservative. People sitting in a park next to the sand, the sand and the dog is on a leash and everybody is behaving. It's interesting. And the technique itself is a radical technique. You know, there's this infinite number of that. So even that is of some interest so that the con conceptual content is conservative, but the delivery is a kind of radical. So anyway, this was, this was a kind of initiative or case or argument. And we're making a roof over a, uh, over a big existing space, which is, which is the drawing in the middle. And the structural system is Verendale trusses. And the Verendale trusses have vertical cords, which are glass tubes. So glass is transparent or what's glass or glass is there or glass isn't there and at the same time the vertical tubes are vertical are cords in compression in a truss so this is a kind of interrogation i guess of what is a verandale or what is a roof or what is glass all of that those are questions that are of some interest so that was the roof in addition to holding up a hunk of glass on top there are auditory constraints because there are various venues within the space and you talk or you speak or you play music or whatever the hell you do. So the curvature of the, in the aggregate, the points, but the curvature in the aggregate has to do with an acoustic issue. So it's what's glass, it's glass and compression, it's glass as structure as a chord and it's also glass in an acoustic rendition. And then the, the client, uh, the Culver City client, saw it, and we thought we had it, and we didn't. And so they're now uh, doing their version, which is a reduced version. Um, 
It's a different kind of conceptual building, I think, for us in that, that do you know the, the Alto Church in Matra of Uxinisca, so that's on your left, the lower, which is, which is a building which uh, the, the, the terms are difficult. It's not formless, but it's formally equivocal. So what are you for? It's not, I mean, antithetical to that would be the Sydney Opera House or something like that. So it's a very different kind of making. And to some extent, uh, this project on Warner Avenue in Culver City uh, has that sensibility. If you, I, I'm not saying it's a mantra, but it has that like, what is it as a configuration, as a shape, as a form, as a kind of definitive statement that it's this and nothing else as opposed to its sort of multiple pieces. And the surfaces aren't surfaces. Again, the surfaces are dots, which has to do uh, with a glass. And I just uh, show you a series of these. And the tubes, of course, are being made in Shenzhen, because America can't quite manage. This actually, this line here in the foreground on the right is actually the line of the grade. So the, so the building is a courtyard. I didn't mention that there was a block in there originally. So this is a block and there's a carve out of the block. And then there's a further modification of the carve out in terms of sun angles and then the glass roof covers that. And what's surrounding it was 10 minutes ago retail and five minutes ago office and two minutes ago, housing. So this is a different conversation we have in a different venue about the efficacy of office and retail and housing and all of that, which is cer certainly a COVID, post-COVID conceptual discussion that we're all dealing with. So this is a new, another new project in that, in that area called the Mariposa. And a kind of agon between a conventional, it's an office building um, for Apple, a conventional space of open office, and then a lot of open areas for the obvious post-COVID reasons, open areas, decks, roof park, private offices, conference rooms, dining stuff, all of that, which inhabit the pieces of the Mariposa, the butterfly. Um, I can just go back, and the only reason I, the, the little building in the middle is a building we did a number of years ago, and this was, it's always somehow the box, we can't get away from this, or the box as an adversary, or the box as an asset, or the box as, as an argument, and so on. So this is a different form and a different argument, a different project, kind of unboxing the box, or outside the box, you always find another box, maybe. So this is an earlier version. Um, anyway, this is uh, the Mariposa project. Can you take a look at that? And you can see again, roof, decks, all of that. So this is one, this is of some interest. So the preservationists show up from Washington, D.C., so it must be extremely important, facetiously. So preservationists do what? So they want to hold on to things or keep things or preserve things as they've been made. So they're... Um, there are four buildings on this site that come from that we did. They're all remodels, uh, small, large, that come from the mid-90s. So the preservationists show up and say, don't touch it. We're going to keep this for posterity, whoever that is, and for whatever those are. This is an interesting argument, um, uh, but not, not for this venue. We obviously said no to that. Um, and that's also a conversation. But anyway, these are, these are buildings that were remodeled over a period of years. They want to preserve, um, uh, let me 
just identify this. The one on the left is a Lindblad Tower. The one in the middle is a Paramount Laundry, because it used to be owned by Paramount. Um, the one on the left is called the Gary Group. And they're amalgamations of pieces. So there's no formulaic way to do this. It's not like saying, keep this and throw away that, or add this and subtract that. So it's a little bit like we used to say, but doesn't really quite apply anymore. Somebody gives you a drawing on a piece of paper and an eraser and says, you can erase some of it, but you can't erase all of it. And when you get done erasing, then something else follows. So to some extent, that's how these buildings were done. There was one other building. It was a theater. This is actually near a downtown, quote unquote, uh, in Culver City, and we designed a theater which was not built for 500, and then there's, a, the, uh, I don't know, 150 people on the roof deck. So we designed that theater, which is actually still part of the conversation, and then began a conversation because across the street from this damn thing, Bezos, Amazon builds a giant Gensler building, new building, huge building, now gargantuan right across the street. So everyone is, of course, saying density changes, times change. The four remodeled buildings either have to go or they have to stay if the uh, preservationists get their way. Or what can you do to add to it, to amend it? So remodel the remodel and put another building there, which may be housing, maybe production studios, maybe whatever. Whatever the hell it is, and these are these are various renditions. Build a theater over the theater, get rid of the theater. This is another one, which is a, a kind of theoretical possibility. This this I won't go through this too much, but it is of some interest to me. So, in case you didn't anticipate an astronomy discussion this evening, so Mars has two moons. Did you know that? Bill Pedersen knows that. Mars has two moons, and they, they're misshapen, they're not spherical, and they rotate in the wrong direction, whatever the wrong direction is. So they rotate, so they break all the rules. And the configuration of this and the surface of this was part of the conversation, uh, the surface and the behavior of Phobos and Demos. So this is the current proposal that's, that's going through the um, illustrious city uh, uh, agencies now. Uh, the, so the site on the upper left, the existing site with the four buildings, and then the, the kind of incision or cut or surgery, whatever term you like, which starts to take down pieces of the four piece uh, the, of the four remodels, as I said, which are themselves examples of taking down previous pieces and so on. And I just go through the sequence on the right, so the second level, and then then elements, for instance, in the Paramount Laundry Building, the Green Building. There was an interior space with, with a series of bridges for conference space and so on. So we tried to preserve those elements in the building, but not treating anything in particular as sacrosanct. In other words, everything can always be erased. What do you erase? What do you leave? What do you add? So just. So again, and uh, this is of some contemporary interest, it was designed originally as an office building with retail. It has an alternative as production studios, it has an alternative as, as apartments, as housing. Um, so this is, I think, the last chapter of this story. And it again has a biblical association, Ishmael, um, who is uh, a character from the Hebrew Bible, but also interestingly, 
winds up the only survivor, as you may recall, in Moby Dick, after Moby Dick uh, smashes the Pequod. And there's Ishmael floating on a coffin. So an adventurer in a way, a wanderer in a way, a hero in a way, a hero in the sense that he produces the narrative. He's the voice of Melville, uh, but really secondary to other characters uh, in, in the book. And I think I was making an association with Ishmael and wandering with a definition of Los Angeles. So there are lots of people with lots of theories and lots of definitions about what the hell is, is Los Angeles. But one of the, one of the I think, on, I mean, there's not a midtown and a downtown. It's not, which is definitive, publishing here, banking now, whatever it is, and how those, those issues might change in Manhattan or wherever it is, for, for example. So in Los Angeles, sometimes it's downtown. Sometimes it's Westwood. Sometimes it's Warner Center. Sometimes it's Santa Monica. Sometimes it's San Pedro. Sometimes Fashionista, it's Melrose Boulevard. Sometimes it's Century City or whatever I left out. And it, it, it's, it really is very much LA hot and cold or up and down, or it's worked on, it's not worked on, and so on and so on. So the question is whether we could produce a kind of definitive center, which would make the antithetical argument that it's a center, that it's enduring, and so on and so on. Meanwhile, not only the ephemeral des points of destination in Los Angeles are venues, uh, but how the city itself is defined in the biggest sense. And in my view, it's largely infrastructure, and it's infrastructure defined in a very predictable, conventional, we all know it, we recognize it, infrastructure, civil engineered way. So it's the river euphemistically, I mean, not the Danube and the Thames and the Hudson. It's concretized. It's a river that goes through Los Angeles and splits the city in many ways into various zones or the power grid or the train tracks or the freeway. So for those of you who know LA a little bit, you're north of the 10 or you're south of the 10 or you're east of the 110 or you're west of the 110 or you're east of the 405 or the west or whatever it is. And those areas, so this is not a city plan, whatever that might be and however that might be in, implemented, but these defining characteristics, which again are infrastructure that largely on top of everything else aren't efficient, don't work, don't meet the civil engineered needs for which they were, purposes for which they were designed. So you can't go anywhere on the freeway and the trains are slower than walking and the river is a debate. And we'll see where the, where the, the concretized river is taken down and so on and so on. So they don't meet their purpose, but they do define sociologically, culturally um, aspects of the city. So anyway, uh, back to this uh, return to this Culver City, Los Angeles area. And this is a building we did in the mid-90s for Sineon Kodak. Uh, and it's an air rights building, which tells you a little bit about the developers, actually, who are willing. It's 100 meters long plus in the air over a road. Um, and they're willing to give up two floors. So in a commercial development sense, so everybody is not applauding that, or everybody on the development side. So lifted the building up on two floors, built the building in the air over the road, limited in width by the fire department who wouldn't let the building expand over the buildings on the other side and so on, and a height limit, which we have now learned to defy. So that was, uh, that was an early example in an area in South Central LA. So uh, this is not the Champs-Élysées or even Wilshire Boulevard and sure as hell ain't Fifth Avenue or anything like that. It's a very different kind of, of thing. Yeah. OK. 
can't get this. I was going to use the laser corner. Uh, but on the, on the upper left is, is the area. I can't reach it with the shadow. But there's a train that runs left and right. Um, yeah, good. But then you, you know the city. You can do it. <laughs> you want to explain it? This is always interesting. You know, you get somebody out of the you trade. Okay? I'll do yours and you can do mine. But anyway, the train running, which is, which is an expo line running through the air, the vertical piece, a river, uh, Bayona uh, Creek, that's the concretized river, and then various new buildings that, that we're doing, hotels and office buildings. The whole thing sits in a park, and one of the ways that we were able to manage the city and get heights and so on for very big buildings is to produce a public park in the city. And the efficacy of the park and the convincingness of the park and all the cars are, are buried below grade, so it is a public park, and they accept it. So this is, this is the one that, that was built. This is a kind of hypothesis of a sort of Janus development of, of, of two faces in different directions, and then a series of high-rise buildings and, and a project that was done for uh, WeWork. Um, of office pods that didn't materialize. So this is the site on the left. And yeah, I was looking at it just sitting in Starbucks before I came over here and thinking, thinking this, is, this is a kind of ideal Renaissance 16th century plan of all things. And I, I mean that a little bit literally and a little bit facetiously. So the buildings in the, what is essentially the center of that circle, that's the site. So the intersection of La Cienega, which is a major boulevard that runs north and south, connects the Sunset Strip with LAX, and then a line that runs, runs horizontal parallel to the bottom of the slide from the beach to downtown and the ocean. So it's kind of this and this inside this, and that's a sort of conceptual diagram. It's the center of the city, strangely enough. So it's a six mile radius from that, notwithstanding it's, it's represented as being on the west side of the city. So if centrality is not an antique idea, and it may be, but it has that aspect, um, then in, in, the, in the center, uh, that's the concretized river and the site in the middle ground and then here, a kind of sense of L.A. As, as boulevards and freeways and so on, which really define the city in, in an essential way and leave so much for us to fix, maybe. So this is a recent conversation. It had, um, uh, I don't know, the last few months, it did a Biennale in Beijing. And it built a big model of the, of the uh, L.A. Culver City project, which was part of a larger conversation. And I, I leave this as an open question, but the idea that the, the making of the city, which leaves old buildings and modifies old buildings in pieces and adds new buildings that are small, and adds, the repertoire is almost infinite. And I think that conversation, as opposed to a kind of ideological sort of a city for three of Voisin plan or something, I knock it all down. And so it, it, it has to do with understanding what it means to look this way and this way and this way simultaneously. So maybe, maybe this is... Um, an argument. I, this is, I just mentioned this because we spent about three years. They, the one thing I would say, you can get a hold of this. Um, this is the last thing that Michael Sorkin did. It's a book. He, he published the book. He's an old friend. Some of you may know him. Wink, I'm sure known. And, and wrote an essay, which is a very touching essay. So I, Michael came to me and said, let's publish the project. So we worked for three years in Nanjing. It wasn't built, but a lot of work was done. Please publish the project and let it go. No, 
So this is Sorkin. We have to publish a book as a kind of UN General Assembly debate. So he calls various characters, and it's, a, it's, a, it's the publication of the project, and it's an argument about the efficacy of the project, its merits, its demerits, of various people, some you know, some you don't, some I know, some I don't, some opinions I think are pretty substantial, and others something else. And so it's, it's a conversation about contemporary urbanism and what's a city, what's a contemporary city, what is a city, and in, in, is it a Chinese city? Is it a northern Chinese city? Is it a kind of generic discussion about urbanism which, which transmutates, I don't have a better word, it could go in Cape Town and London and New York, and, or does it belong to a particular place and the Yangtze River is flying through it? Well, anyway, uh, we worked on that for a long time. And these are other examples just over the years. One, the one on the top is Ibiza. The one on the bottom was of particular interest. It's a kind of inverse. It was done when we were doing these projects in, in Havana, near the Malecon. And it's carved out. It has associations if you're fans, sports fans or baseball fans, like the Fenway maybe, which is sort of oddly configured because of the, the neighborhood in, in Boston or Wrigley Field is another one where you're in the left field bleachers. I don't know, this may, again, Mickey Mouse and baseball and things like that. But the high-rise housing is on the left field of Wrigley Field. It just makes it so. This is, in a way, an accommodation in Havana of, of existing conditions in a city and imposing a building and carving out the city Sort of. And so there are pieces of the old city that show up in the new stadium and so on and so on. So this is the next project. And then the uh, uh, developmentally, and I, I take this one because it's closer to me, the tower, um, which we call in the, in the foreground called the turtle, the bridge over the L.A. River, a kind of Ponte Vecchio type bridge. In other words, it's, it is a destination and you can live and you can work and you can buy flowers for your boyfriend or girlfriend. You can do it and you can look up and down the river, which isn't a hell of a view, but maybe it'll get better and get rid of the concrete. So the bridge between two cities and two largely digital communities, LA on the left, Culver City on the right, and then the tower, and then this other tower we'll get to in a minute, which is called Trajan's Tower and so on and so forth. This is a bridge scheme that goes back a number of years on the left and a more recent version on the right. And this is a tower. This is approved. Um, and now it's a question. It was approved as office. Um, parking is uh, all the parking and there's not a hell of a lot of it, is below grade. The first level or the first three floors or zones is, a con is a, like a convention facility, exhibition facility, theaters above that, street in the sky above that, housing above that, office above that, and so on. And you can see some, that's the theater zone on the right, and the street in the sky a little bit in the middle. So this one, where should I start on this? Is this one we call Trajan's Tower, which seems um, like an antique, but I, but I tell you why I did it. This, do you know the, the cistern in Istanbul across from Hagia Sophia? Um, but it, the cistern was across from Hagia Sophia when there was no Hagia Sophia, so chronologically. So this is the Romans, and the conversation is, how does architecture change over time? And I think my answer to that is sometimes cataclysmically and radically and as adversaries as opposed to calm and collected and evolutionary. So this is the cataclysm versus the Darwinian theory. This is the cataclysm. So the Romans came to Constantinople 
and they built a cistern which catches water. You should really go and see it. So I don't know, the last time I made this argument, Wolf jumped up and he said, you're making all this up, which is a little bit true. But, it, but, it, but there, are grounds, there, there are grounds for it. So they took, uh, so you know the snakes in the head, and if you look, to be careful, because if you look too long at that, you turn to stone. Watch it. So the story of the Medusa and the Greek myth, so the Greeks built a temple not far from this site, an old temple. The Greeks, Aeschylus, Phidias, Sophocles, small scale, poetic, all of those kinds of, different. And the Romans came, big scale, um, aggrandizing, I don't know, self-aggrandizing, empire, introverts, extroverts. So this is a sort of what's Athens, what's Greece, what's Rome, and so on. So the Romans took the temple and the Medusa heads, cut it up, took it apart, cut it up, and took the, the Medusa head, which is the capital, flipped it upside down, and stuck it in the water, okay? Which, in my interpretation, is a way of saying, we're going to do, you do this, we're going to do this. You had your turn, this is now. So they radically disrupted, uh, I think, the religiosity, the order, the organization. And when you go to the cistern, which is below grade, uh, and you can see several of these column heads. This is spectacular, and it has a it, it has a lot of emotive power. Whether you agree with my argument or whether whether you don't. And then the other example of how do things change? Uh, so this is uh, our friend Nero and the Domus Aurea. Um, which is always associated, I don't know, it's just one of, one of your heroes here, but Lou Kahn and the Kimball and the Domus Aurea. So this is, this is Nero's house, Domus Aurea. I don't think you can get in there anymore. And then Trajan comes along, like not too long after, and builds his bath and shoves it down and imposes it and insists on it on top of Nero. So what does that mean? And didn't collapse it, but made every effort to do it. So the intersection of former times, contemporary times, and adversaries, and the collision of personalities, and the collision of architecture contents as they're read over time. So this is of some interest too, in other words, how do we change? incrementally or cataclysmically or radically. And I just to finish this, this long-winded conversation, and this is a tower we're making, um, which is this we don't have approval for. It has some office space, it has some media, it has a museum underground, and we call it Trajan's Tower. And I think we and you and all of us at some level are joining this conversation. What's a tower? What constitutes a tower? So there's Brancusi on the left and Shukov, I don't know if you know this, they, they tried to repair Shukov's tower and conceivably, I don't know, conservationists and put big hunks of steel. Maybe some of you have seen it, it's very unfortunate. But anyway, this conversation about what constitutes a tower and joining that conversation, which is, I don't know, 150 years old and so on. So the buildings on this site, um, there's one which is called the wrapper. This is the second wrapper, which now began as an office building. It's lifted in the air over a plaza, which turns out to be a wheat field. This is a park, which is a wheat field. So it's lifted up in the air, and you can see some of this. And I just go through. It's interesting. You know, I was looking at this in that uh, uneventful afternoon in Starbucks. I'm looking at the diagonal tensions in the diagonals in the trusses in the building. So the, the, the three circles are points of support. And the diagonals are going the wrong way. 
if the corner so originally, so I have to acknowledge this originally, it was not supported on the corner. So that's a different conversation. And so maybe that's the who's not a slave conversation. So we can we can talk about that. But anyway, when I go through this, and there there are a series of of uh, the trusses, and then the rings, and then floors in the pipe, which early in the conversation was actually a cyclotron. Um, and then concretized. And you can see the rings which hold. So this is the way we, it's not necessarily the way it's imagined, but it's a, it's a way that it's analyzed and we discourse back and forth with the engineers in case they're, they're listening. And you can see, you know, so this is the wheat field. You can, you can see the pipe and the rings. And these are the columns which are held on the rings which hold up the building. and the floors and the exiting and the glazing. Now the last one I want to share with you has, has a kind of long and whatever the term is, long and winding um, pedigree or history or something. It started, this is uh, the Wexner and we did, in the late 90s, we did an exhibition. And part of the conversation in the exhibition had to do with challenging, I don't know if you know, the, the, the Wexner's at Ohio State, it's a museum, uh, which is both an old building and a new building and includes an old armory and so on and so on. And when Peter did it, it was a conceptual argument that had to do with, among other things, grids and the form of the grid, but it's not the microwave grid so much as the grid and the grid as a kind of defining order and a folded grid or a bent grid and so on. And it doesn't admit a kind of curved line argument. So it's like Hippodamus and Miletus, which goes all the way back in the grid. And we introduced a, a contradictory argument, which is called the dancing bleachers. And that was the building we did. Then we did another one, the exhibition, which is, I don't know if the gallery is still open. It's in the Flak Tower. You know the Flak Tower. You know, which used to be an anti-aircraft bunker with six-foot thick poured concrete walls in the first district <clears throat> in Vienna, which became a gallery. Uh, so this, this is, I guess, remains in that gallery. And then there's this is with, with the sort of usual characters. It's not a very good slide, but it, it hanging in L.A., hanging at Cyark, and there's a conversation about the meaning and the purposes of that. I like the quote. Maybe it, it appeals to you because it has to do with a kind of possible exegesis of how this was done and how the geometries worked. So if you've got 17 years, we can sit in Starbucks and we can discuss it. Uh, and this was the original scheme, originally two towers um, for, the, for the first wrapper project. So this is, this is a foundation conversation. So this is what happens if you do, I have to give credit where credit is not due, I shouldn't say this. This is Arab's animation. And the building, I think, is the only commercial building, certainly in America, which is sitting on isolators. Uh, maybe you guys can correct me on that. But as far as I know, it's the only commercial building on isolators. There are a couple in Los Angeles. One is a religious building, one is a political building. Um, but the conceptual idea is, is antithetical to, to a conventional notion of what is a foundation, which either goes down to rock or hell or something. Which, which stabilize, substantiates, anchors, whatever term you like, 
the building at its at its base at its feet and you build from there so we have a mat foundation that does that but at the level of the ground or the garage and you can come in the garage and you can see the isolators uh, in the tradition of techno, mechanical, and so on and so on. This is a conversation. Whether it's done is an issue, why it's done is an issue, and whether it's visible or not. So my answer to that was, yep, yep, yep. You may have a different answer, but the, but the utility of the system allows the building to, to operate in an earthquake, in, an earth, you know, I mean, in the zone around the Pacific Ocean in a very unusual way. And you can see the points in the diagram on the, on the left, the points of, of where the isolators are. And it, it, by the way, and it's, it's of some interest that in the, the building is all judicially completely illegal. So you can't do any of this according to the building code. So we're not in Shenzhen, we're in LA, we're in America. And what you have to do is hire particular consultants, which the owner was willing to do. And then you have 24 people in a room and 25 opinions, and you go through that. But you have to be willing to do it. And we're certainly willing to do it. And the clients are willing to do it. And the city was reluctantly willing to do it. And we did it. And uh, as opposed to saying, which is an interesting argument, let the engineers engineer the building. They're responsible for the building. Go build it. It's their project. But, but uh, it was a little more circuitous in, in Los Angeles. I, just to explain this, because, because I think the intricacy in this conversation is exaggerated, there are a series of curved lines in various directions for various reasons. But something which is asymptotic to or approximates what we would call for the, for the LA city <coughs> uh, building and safety people. So that is a column, okay? That is a cord or a beam. So you got that, you got that, you got that, which then supports that. That's why it doesn't fall down so far. Um, and then there are a series of hyperbolic walls there that are, that are a function, a kind of organizational visual function of these ribbons. The ribbons, by the way, are steel tubes. They're a foot by five feet made, if you're interested, somewhere between Germany and Brussels, and, but the fabrication is in China. So this in, in, in the middle, in the foreground, that's the building that I showed you, which was the first one. The first one we did in the late 90s. And then the tower, the core is pulled out of the building. So the floors are open. There are no columns. 13 six floors, 16 six floors, 24 foot floors with mezzanines. So this is also not I mean, the pulled out core, I think Inland Steel did that a long time ago, it was a Skidmore building. So it's not unknown, but it's rare, but it opens up the interior floor. So if we want to make an argument in terms of utility or use or flexibility and all of that, it is a building that lends itself. Those are plausible arguments because of the core removed, because of the columns removed, and so on. If, if those, and that's the core, and so on. By the way, that's the uh, ubiquitous 10-mile-an-hour uh, train, uh, the Expo line uh, that, that runs by on the north side. And it's a series of, of images of the building. The stair on the uh, slide on the left, the, uh, the right side of the slide on the left, is an exit stair. The other exit stair is in the core. And this is just a for instance of a repetitive situation which isn't. So the 13-6 fluoride, the 16-6 fluoride, and the 24-foot fluoride, the 24, as I said, or maybe I didn't say, also has a mezzanine. 
and this is the viewers that are working on this now, but that's the lobby um, or the entry lobby on the left. Uh, this doesn't show it very well, but there is a pedestrian route. Uh, the building is right next to the Expo Line station, and you come out of the Expo Line station, and there's a long stair and takes you right up into the building. So we're attempting to be sociologically accommodating and less cars and more pedestrians. And you probably are familiar with that argument. This is supposed to play, isn't gonna play. Mr. Video Operator, we got Wagner and Tannhäuser, or we don't. See, you lost the tension of the, is it gonna play? Uh, thank you. Thank you again. Thanks to KPF team, uh, to Penn, to Winka, should I say the AIA, and the, and the AIA. Thank you very much. See you again. Not sure if anyone has questions. Will you take a few questions? Why not? Sure. Anybody with questions? Here's one. Thank you for your amazing presentation, and I love your designs also. Uh, and I have a question about like. Uh, I think maybe can you move the microphone a little okay. bit don't don't swallow it okay sorry uh I have a question about like uh I think you could, your design needs to persuade your clients so uh I'm thinking about I am nervous maybe like uh Oh, okay. Take your time. I think your design needs to persuade a client a lot. I think uh, so. Like, how do you manage your your business like from the start? Because I think uh, I I love your design and and I want to design like you, but. In the first day of my business, I think clients are not liking it. I think, yeah, that's why I'm asking you. I think. That's why the sun stood still. I mean, there's a reason for that. I mean, I appreciate the, uh, the compliment. If it was a compliment, I think it was. I'll take it that way. Um, I don't think um, you don't want to design like me. I already did it. You have to design in a different way. 
and, and how that evolves and what that means and how that adds to the conversation and architecture is really the question because that's not a conversation that ever ends. It may, in the lexicon, ebb or flow. It may stop and start and so on and so on. So I think the question for you is to try to understand or begin to understand what you want to do and why you want to do it and how you can make it happen. Uh, and there are a lot of different routes to that, um, a lot of different paths, a lot of different strategies. And I think if you need to do it, maybe this sounds cartoonish. If you need to do it, you'll find a way to do it. And maybe some of the things that we've shown here are helpful or encouraging or illustrative attitudinally or conceptually. And so you can share in that the way I share in Roman cisterns or rooftops in Cambodia or something. Because again, and I said that you could make a different argument that the Philip Glass, the video I showed, it's all one building. There's another level of that. It's all one building. Different. So we're all working on, it's a big building. And we're all working on that building. So I would encourage you, maybe this is an obvious thing to say, and you're going to, you'll find a way. Subterfuge, overt, covert, depends what you want to do. And I think we all look forward to seeing what you do. Anybody else? I'll ask a question. Um, you gave us the provocation of, do you think the architecture needs healed right now or not? And I'm very curious to hear your own answer to the question that you gave us. Well, my answer to that question was the tension between, so I dodged the question, you could, you could say. In other words, my answer was, needs a hero, doesn't need a hero, should have a hero. There's another question we could ask was, what the hell is a hero? What constitutes heroism generally in architecture? I mean, to, to raise a completely extraneous subject, which probably wouldn't normally be since we've already talked about. I was listening to in Starbucks, that was in quite an afternoon in Starbucks, and listening to the to the governor of your next door ex governor Chris Christie talk a little bit, to me that's a hero. You know, so the, the different ways of 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 defining this conversation, but the aspiration I think to move, even if it's in a solitary way, even if it's unsupported, and there's you, and maybe nobody else. Or maybe there's you. And I, when I look at the profession of architecture, I mean, there are some colleagues. There are a few. Most of them aren't in Los Angeles. And sometimes they're collegial, and sometimes we're fighting with each other. <laughs> Not me, but they. And, and uh, I think heroism, uh, in the sense of who's not a slave, Raymond Abraham, Lebius Woods, which is risk, but this is so often repeated, or courage, or another one, which is, I was gonna say sustainability, but has other kind of durability and the sort of vicissitudes of things. And everyone doesn't have the stomach for that, I don't think. So there is a kind of heroism. It doesn't have to be acknowledged with a Nobel Peace Prize. It probably won't be. But I think there is something, a kind of integrity in that process. Um, I mentioned Reichward, I, for me, I think is an exception. I mean, obviously, people that have been part of this institution, including the recent director, who embody that as a kind of professional behavior. You don't have to do this all day. 
But you're doing that in a way. So I think if I had to vote hero or no, I would vote for hero. That's a good question. <clears throat> Anybody else? Okay, thank you. See you again.